Hello, thank you for those joining us online and in person. My name is Jillian Sarver. I am a freshman scholar, and I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Alexander Hudson, a writer, po popular speaker, and the founder of Civic Renaissance, a publication and intellectual community dedicated to beauty, goodness, and truth. She was named the 2020 Novak Journalism Fellow and continues and continues and contributes to Fox News, CBS News, The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Time Magazine, Politico Magazine, and Newsweek. She earned a master's degree in public policy at the London School of Economics as a Rotary Scholar and is an adjunct professor at the Indiana University Lilly School of Philanthropy. She is also the creator of a series for the teaching company called Storytelling in the Human Condition, now available for streaming, as well as the author of the book, The Soul of Civility. She now lives in Indianapolis, Indiana, with her husband and children. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Alexandra Hudson. Thank you, Jillian. Hi, everyone. Can, um, can everyone hear me OK? I know we're recording this. Do I sound OK for a record? Awesome. Thank you so much for having me in Louisville. Thank you to Greg for this gracious introduction. Thank you to the university and to the McConnell Center. It's a real honor and a privilege to be here. And I understand that you guys are spending the year reading Tocqueville. Is that correct? I just want to affirm the institution, not just for having me graciously, but also for giving you this gift. And this is a profound gift that I hope that you just steward and relish and cherish every day. That is my dream. I hope that I can get to a point in my life where I can just read Tocqueville for a year. That is literally an aspiration of mine. Um, and I hope that you're just enjoying it. Just every page, every paragraph is just jumping at you with insights, poignant insights that, um, that are relevant today, more relevant than ever. It's the single best book, as you know, written on America and on democracy. And, you know, I write, I have a whole chapter in my book dedicated to a concept that Tocqueville is pretty famous for, this concept of, of civil society. Have you guys gotten to that part yet where you've explored, you know, what is civil society? You know, what is civil society? I'm serious. Raise your hand or throw out a, throw out a question. What, what is it? Based on your readings of Tocqueville and your exploration of the topic so far, what is it? Any thoughts? Well, I'll tell you, we'll start tonight talking about what civil society is, uh, and at least how it's been conceived by different people in different times and places. And then we'll talk about a timeless threat to, to, to civil, civilized society, to civil society, a timeless solution, as I explore my book, The Soul of Civility. So I, I talk about civility, the art of human flourishing, as a timeless solution um, to, to this timeless problem, timeless threat to civil society. And, uh, and how it supports really the, the, the art of human flourishing, how our everyday micro interactions with one another really support this, this important institution, this third ins institution that's not quite government, not quite the level of the individual, but this kind of th third sphere that is es especially essential to a democracy. And then, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about, about the, timeless, uh, to the timeless theme of civil society. And also, we'll end with an exploration of how we can each be part of the solution to these deep and big problems in our world today of, of division, of partisanship, of social alienation, all of which make our lives a little bit worse, but also have big consequences for our democracy. And I know we're all interested in, in statesmanship and democracy. These are all things that you're, you're exploring here as McConnell scholars. So um, I wanted to start with a fun story that I like to call the uncivil roots of civil society. So our phrase civil society was actually given to us from an essay uh, by a gentleman named Adam Ferguson. Raise your hand if you've heard of Adam Ferguson before. No one, I know, when I was writing this chapter, I like went on YouTube, I went to the podcast, I like went to all these places that I wanted to hear like a good lecture on Adam Ferguson. It doesn't exist. We need like someone to stage an Adam Ferguson revival. He's definitely the lesser known Adam of the Scottish Enlightenment. Can anyone tell me the more famous Adam? 
Adam Smith, exactly. So Adam Smith is the more famous Adam of the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, you know, he's famous for his, his, his magnum opus, the, the Wealth of Nations, an inquiry into the nature of the Wealth of Nations that gave us this you know, exploration of, of capitalism and, um, and just an inquiry into, into how wealth is gained and, how, and why, do, why are some countries wealthy and others, uh, others you know, still, still at subsistence level. But um, Adam Smith's other book, uh, is called, uh, other essential book is called A Theory of Moral Sentiments. And I encourage you all to take some time with TMS at some point in your life. Um, you know, if, if ever, he's famous for Wealth of Nations, which is this kind of theory of economic harmony and flourishing. But Theory of Moral Sentiments is this, like, un way vastly underrated book that is kind of his theory of social flourishing, interpersonal flourishing. And I, I studied this book very closely and derived many insights into uh, that, that have found themselves in my book. And a lot of it is really compatible uh, with kind of Tocquevillian ideas of, of human flourishing. And so I think that, um, you know, if you can get past the, the language barrier, just the kind of the cultural language barrier, you, you kind of get this in Tocqueville too, like you're reading an English translation. And I heard you're reading the Liberty Fund translation, which is an excellent translation. Um, but but you, what you what we miss, what we get in language, we, we often miss in cultural allusions, you know, Tocqueville and Smith and, and even reading the Federalist Papers, there are allusions to, you know, Greek mythology and, and, and things that would have been common in educational systems in the parlance of the day a few hundred years ago that we just can't take for granted anymore. So anyway, once you get past the sort of like cultural language barrier with, uh, with Tocqueville or with, with, with Adam Smith, it's just also a book that's worth your time brimming with insight. So that's all a tangent, a plug for the, the, the more well-known Adam Smith and his lesser work, Theory of Moral Sentiments. But anyway, um, Adam Ferguson wrote this essay called An Inquiry into the Nature of Civil Society. And this is where we get our phrase, civil society, from, right in the, in the um, kind of second half of the, of the 1750s. And Adam Smith cried plagiarism. They were friends. And, and Adam Smith accused Adam Ferguson of plagiarizing his work. <laughs> and um, Adam, Adam Ferguson's defense was that, no, 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 I didn't plagiarize your work, Adam Smith. But we did drink from a similar intellectual well. You know, you read Montaigne, I read Montaigne. You read Montesquieu, I read Montesquieu. So I didn't plagiarize you. You know, we were borrowing from people who had come before us. So anyway, that was a permanent rift in the relationship of these two famous atoms of the Scottish Enlightenment. But in this famous, in this famous but underknown essay on the inquiry into the nature of civil society, Adam Ferguson gives us his theory of civil society. And by civilized society, he really means a theory of a civilization itself. Like what does it mean to move from a state of kind of subsistence level primitive barbarism into a more sophisticated state of being above subsistence level? And, and what is the stuff of kind of human community and, and communal bonds? And you know, what's interesting is that Smith, uh, sorry, not Smith, Ferguson, Adam Ferguson, he was actually worried about the state of civil society when he wrote this essay in the 1700s. <laughs> He was worried about this thing called commerce and capitalism and markets for what it was doing to um, foster self-love and individualism and to alienate us from community and one another. And that's really interesting because we'll come back to this idea um, later. So anyway, that's just a fun story I wanted to open with. The uncivil roots of civil society. Now you know. Also, I hope you'll go take a look at this essay, the uh, Adam, Adam Ferguson's essay on, the, on, the, on civil society for yourself. And also do take a look of, at Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments, also worth, worth reading. So uh, what's fun about you know, reading an essay that gave us this phrase, civil society, and hearing an argument that we hear today, you know, we hear people arguing that you know, we're commercialized, we're too utilitarian. Right, it's commerce is disintegrating. Markets are disintegrating our bonds, and and um, and we're 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 too defined by self-love, and it breeds selfishness. It's undermining community. We hear that today, right? But people were worried about that 300 years ago, and this is a core argument I make in my book, The Soul of Civility. That this question that my book is about: How do we do life together? How do we not just peacefully coexist, but how might we actually flourish? across deep difference, that this is not a new question. It's not a new problem. In fact, it's a timeless one. 
It's one we've been grappling with as long as we've been around, as a species in fact. As human beings, we are defined by two competing forces, love of others and love of self. We become fully human in relationship with others. We are doggedly social. We are socially resilient as a species. We, uh, we become our best selves in, in, in community. Um, and yet, morally and biologically, we are driven by self-love. We are driven to meet our own needs before those of others. And those two facets of who we are, our intention, the love of others, love of self. And this is the timeless threat to human community and human civilization and, and, and human relationship, friendship. Um, we are, you know, this, this, this competing, this duality within each of us. And um, I love the story. Raise your hand if you know the story, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's story of, of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll. This is a story, you know, we might be familiar with in lore, kind of at the abstract level, but I love the way that this, this, this story illuminates the reality about this divided nature within the human condition. So the story goes, also in Scotland, we have a Scottish theme I didn't even realize so far. So uh, it takes place in Edinburgh. Uh, um, Dr. Jekyll is this prestigious, illustrious, universally adored and respected physician in Edinburgh. And yet he struggles with these base desires, these base impulses, these, um, these, these urges that he can't quite shake. And so he devises in his basement laboratory a potion that he drinks and it allows him to transform into the monstrous, barbaric, inhumane, and cruel Mr. Hyde. So he drinks this potion by night, transforms into Mr. Hyde, into a totally different person. And then he's able to, you know, hurt people, rob people, do, wreak havoc, like give life, animate these baser urges without consequence, without impugning his pristine reputation as the illustrious, prestigious Dr. Jekyll. And although it seems like a perfect solution, you know, he's able to maintain his, his um, veneer of, of prestige and, and his good reputation by day, and then you know, he, he animates the Mr. Hyde by night, but something strange begins to happen. The more that he drinks his potion, the more power Mr. Hyde has over him. Until eventually, he begins to transform into Mr. Hyde spontaneously, without even drinking the potion at all. And he eventually becomes permanently Mr. Hyde. And in his, in his note where, he, he, where Mr. Hyde ends up killing him and, and he's found dead, um, he, he, he leaves a note saying, you know, I tried to balance, you know, wh what is man, friend or fiend, right? That we have this duality within, a, within a, each of us. And the truth is, he says in this note, we are irrevocably both, both of us. We, we both have a little bit of uh, friend, a little bit of fiend, a little bit of Dr. Jekyll, noble, you know, um, good, altruistic, but also monstrous, barbaric, cruel, malicious, senselessly so. And the interesting theme and idea from, from the story is that, you know, yes, we may always have these baser parts of us, this ignoble part of us, but the more we animate it, the more we give life to it, the more we exercise it, the more it becomes part of us. And soon, it, it, it takes over us entirely. Raise your hand if you've heard of St. Augustine before. I love that, most people in here. St. Augustine is one of my favorite philosophers, one of the most important philosophers um, in kind of Western history, although he's from North Africa, uh, from, from modern day Algeria. And uh, he was a Neoplatonist and just a really important formative thinker at the fall of the Roman Empire. He has this concept in his famous book called City of God, exploring the causes about the nature, the nature of, the, of the fall of the Roman Empire, where he, he says, um, he calls this aspect of the human condition the libido dominandi. Who has a background in Latin here, anyone? The libido dominandi. Can you tell me, take a guess as to, as to what it means? Libido dominandi. So the libido means lust, okay? The lust to dominate. That's what the libido dominandi is. But it's interesting that this is actually 
wordplay in the original Latin, because it's not, it's not just the lust to dominate that we all have. But as we learned in the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the more that we indulge that lust to dominate others, that lust becomes the lust that dominates us. The lust to dominate becomes the dominating lust, exactly as we saw uh, Dr. Hyde, Mr. Hyde take over Mr. D Dr. Jekyll in that story. So a uh, timeless problem because of this duality in the human condition, in human, in human nature. Uh, and again, this is a part of the human personality that we all share. And so no you know, single epiphenomenon, no single politician, no technology is the cause of this problem because we've been dealing with this problem since the dawn of our species. People in all times and all places have been grappling with this question of how do we overcome these baser aspects of who we are, this self-love, this lust to dominate that defines all of us, and how do we thrive and peacefully coexist in community? And this is, this is chapter two of my book that I am so thrilled that uh, you guys all have a copy of, that remarkably, people have independently come to similar conclusions about the solution to this timeless problem. And the solution that they propose is civility, which is the art of human flourishing. It is, it is the restraint of the self, these baser desires, for the sake that the higher, more, more noble goal of doing life in community and in friendship with others. And, um, and, and so I love, for example, did you know that the oldest book in the world is a civility book? You would know if you've read the book. Has anyone read the book yet? <laughs> this is, this is a, uh, the Maxims of Tahotep in ancient Egypt, uh, 2350 BC, so over 4,000 years ago. This guy named Tahotep, he was at the pinnacle of temporal power. He um, was an advisor to the pharaoh in ancient Egypt and was actually offered the role, the position of becoming pharaoh himself, which he turned down in order to live a quiet and uh, pastoral life in, um, in, in retirement. So he turned down political temporal power to retire. And once he was in retirement, he thought deeply about the timeless principles of human flourishing. And he decided to write down his maxims for how to do life together with others for Pharaoh's son, who was going to be Pharaoh one day in hopes that he would become a wise, virtuous, and just ruler that would instill virtue and nobility in his people. And what's amazing, you know, you can, you can go to um, you know, Google as soon as we're done here and look up these teachings of Tahotep and read these 37 maxims. It's not very long, this oldest book in the world. And you will find that these maxims are remarkably timeless. They could appear in a, a book, a self-help book written today about how to just like do life together with others. Has anyone heard of Judith Martin? I know, I know my generation, we don't really, and your generation, we don't really read newspapers anymore, but there's this lady called Judith Martin, and she's been writing manners columns. She's called Miss Manners, and she's been writing this etiquette, these etiquette columns for the Washington Post for like 40 years. And what's funny is that these teachings of Tahotep, written over 4,000 years ago, could appear in the Washington Post and these Miss Manners columns today. They're just remarkably timeless. For example, Tahotep says, you know, do not respond with anger in the heat of a moment. Like, take a, take a, te take a step back, take a deep breath, and then, and, then, and then respond, right? Good for the social media era, right, where it's really easy to just, like, respond in kind, like you, you see someone and you just want to you know, hit them back, but you know, take a break, take a breath, don't respond to your disputant in the heat of the moment. Um, Tahotep says, do not be good to your friends or your neighbors just when you need something. Be good to them, generous with them all the time, just because they're your friends, your family, your neighbors, they're people just like you. Tahotep says, do not abuse a power differential. If you have a, th don't curb your, your libido dominandi is what he's saying, right? If you have authority over someone, don't exploit that. Be gracious and kind 
and gentle to those whom you are stronger than or have authority over. Tahotep says, also appropriate in the age of social media, do not slander. He has four or five different maxims prohibiting gossip because the temptation to spread untruths about others behind their back when they can't defend themselves because it makes us feel better and more self-righteous, that is just as, as much a temptation today as it was in the first book over 4,000 years ago. So timeless problem, timeless solution. And in chapter two of my book, I go through some of the greatest hits of this genre, this conduct manual genre from, from across history, from across culture, from ancient, ancient Sanskrit culture in India to the Middle East to um, uh, Isocrates in ancient, ancient Greece who is the mismanners of the Greco-Roman world, to Daniel of Beckles who is the Emily Post of the Middle Ages, to our own George Washington you know, who wrote these 110 rules of civility that weren't out of thin air. You know, he didn't just make them up. They were an assignment that he was given um, in order to, uh, you know, inculcate virtue, and it was a handwriting exercise, but these were borrowed from a Jesuit etiquette handbook that was in, in turn borrowed by uh, Giovanni della Casa and his Il Galateo, another Italian kind of courtesy book, that was in turn pilfered from Aristotle, his Nicomachean Ethics. You know, like there is this, there is this iterative dialogue Across, across time and across place about this question of how do we do life together across difference. You know, there, there is this core of human wisdom that has been passed down across generation by people who have taken the time to study the writings and teachings of those who have come before them. But what's incredible beyond that, people have come to similar ideas about how to do this thing called life together independent of one another, without having read Aristotle, without having read you know, the, 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 the great conversation, those who have come before them. Because why? Human nature doesn't change. These are people who have just thoughtfully observed the human, the human condition and human, and human nature and said, what works when it comes to this thing called life together with others? Let's do more of that. And what doesn't work? OK, let's avoid that. And. Um, and of course, these people, Tahotep, um, Isocrates, Daniel of Beckles, Erasmus of Rotterdam, they would not have had to write down these maxims if everyone were already following them, right? It's like, it's like gravity, this gravitational pull towards self-love, to doing you know, what we want to do and not what, it, not, not what is best for community and not what's even best for ourselves. Right? Like we know the best life is the life in friendship, and yet we do things so many times, you know, that are that are that self-sabotage that end. You know, we do things that are in our immediate self-interest, but not in our long-term self-interest. Uh, like Tocqueville's idea of enlightened self-interest, right? That that doing what is um, what is more beneficial to us in the, in, the, in the longer term. So timeless problem, timeless solution. What can be done? It's really easy to feel helpless, powerless, these, these big macro problems. Well, I learned firsthand that there's a lot more that each of us can do than we might realize. And I'll tell you how I learned this. So part of my story is that I um, you know, came to my interest in manners and etiquette and, and civility, honestly. My mother is something of a manners expert. She's called. Judy the Manners Lady, and I'm not even kidding you, not to be confused with Judith Martin, the Washington Post Miss Manners, and I, I'm not even joking you, I discovered two other Judys who are Manners Ladies, other than my mother, other than Judith Martin the Washington Post. Anyone seen The Wizard of Oz, the original one, Judy Garland? So that came out like the same decade that my mother and these other Judys I think were born, so it was like a generational name, like everyone was named Judy, and several of them went to the Manners industry, and so my mother is my favorite of these Judiths in the courtesy and etiquette biz. She um, modeled for my brother and I true hospitality, you know, kindness to the stranger, having our lives be, um, you know, sow seeds of trust and light and love in a, in a way that makes us, the world a, bi a brighter and better place. Our home growing up was a revolving door of newcomers to our community, new neighbors, homestays, immigrants, and you know there was just always room for one more at the table. 
uh, much to my father's chagrin. He was much more of an introvert. And um, you know, my, my, my home life growing up was like you know, uh, Julie Andrews and Mary Poppins. Like everything was a song and just like so much joy and, and, and life. And um, in addition to that, my mother taught us you know, the ways and means of etiquette and, and politeness. You know, she taught us how to shake people's hand with a firm handshake and look people in the eye, how to set our table just so with forks here, knives here. And I am constitutionally allergic to authority. I hate rules. I hate being told what to do. To this day, you know, someone tells me to do something, I'm like, why? Give me a good justification for it. And so this, this definitely, you know, applied growing up where my mother would tell us to do something. And I'd want to know why, you know, why do we do things the way that we do them? Um, my mother, you know, frustrated with my inquiring mind said, just do it. This is just the way we've always done it. You know, just don't ask questions, just get, get it done, what I'm asking you to do. So these questions always lingered with me. They, they stem from my, my upbringing. To some extent, this book is a book I've been writing my ho whole life, thinking about these questions and, and ideas. And, um, you know, I, I, even though I question these rules of etiquette and propriety, I generally followed them because my mother promised they would lead to success in work and school and life, and she was right until I found myself in federal government. <laughs> you guys talk about statecraft and statesmanship here at the McConnell Center, right? Like, McConnell's a statesman, he truly is. And how many of you, you know, think about going to politics one day yourself? Raise your hand, or politics, the public sphere of policy, you know? Like, I, I did too, you know, I, I loved ideas, I'm passionate about, intellectual history and the way that ideas, good ideas, can make people's lives better. And, and this was my big break. I was in federal government, I was at the United States Department of Education, and this was my chance to see the ideas I loved be put into practice to maybe help America's students just a little bit. I could not have been more disillusioned or discouraged by what I found in government. I had my idealism thoroughly uh, knocked out of me in just one year of federal service that I joke took years out of my, <laughs> off my life. Um, you know, I, I, there were many, many things that frustrated me about my time in, in government service, but the, the most salient t for our purposes today was that it was really an environment of anti-human flourishing. It was just pure survivalism. You know, it was just people who um, saw others purely in terms of their own aims and how can they help me get what I want. And that was just an exhausting environment to be in. So I, I was surrounded by these two extremes. I'd be interested what Mc, Mr., uh, Senator McConnell would say if he, if, he, if he heard this. I hope to, uh, I was thrilled to be able to sign a, a book for him. But I, um, you know, this, this is very typical of Washington, not just Washington. This is, again, a timeless problem that emerges from a part of the human condition that we all share. But this was, you know, a dominant part of my experience in, in Washington. That I saw these two extremes. On one hand, there were people who were overtly hostile. They had sharp elbows, they were willing to step on anyone to get ahead, get what they wanted. They'd berate, you know, yell anyone down who was in their way, blame and shame and, and diminish. And I knew to stay away from those people. You know, they showed their cards early. I was like, okay, do not associate. There was another contingent, though. And often this contingent compri was comprised of the more polished and sophisticated and experienced politicos. These are the people who would smile and flatter me and others one moment and then stab us in the back the next, the moment that we no longer served their purposes. And that was deeply perplexing to me. One thing my mother had said to me growing up was that manners mattered because they were an outward expression of our inward character. And yet here I was surrounded by a contingent of people who were well-mannered and polished enough, and yet ruthless and cruel. And I realized upon reflection that these seem like polar opposites at first, but they're actually very similar. Both modes have an insufficiently high view of the dignity of the human person and instrumentalize 
those around them. Again, they see other people in terms of what they can do for them and not, and not, not as ends in themselves. Beings with dignity and worth, worthy of respect, just by virtue of our shared moral status, our equal human dignity as persons. They both, in their own discreet ways, give rise to the self-love, to the libido dominandi that is in all of us. The, 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 the one can, in, the, in the hostile contingent, it's more obvious, right? They just steamroll and, and, and step on anyone to get ahead and get what they want. But the other contingent, the more polished contingent, is a little more subtle and nuanced, but no less ruthless, no less manipulative, you know, manipulating others in order to get what they want and get ahead. That, that, that's a, a form of exploitation. That's a form of, of, um, of domination when you use someone, when you manipul manipulate them like that. So this, this environment exhausted me. Um, it also clarified for me that what, what is a core argument of my book, this essential distinction between civility and politeness. I realized that they were not the same. Again, I was surrounded by this contingent who was very polished, very polite, but ruthless and cruel and still animated by this, this inherent self-love that we all share. And I realized that politeness is manners. It's etiquette. It's external. It's technique. It's the superficial stuff. Whereas civility is internal. It's a disposition of the heart. It's a way of seeing others as our moral equals who are worthy, again, of a bare minimum of respect just by virtue of our shared dignity, our shared equal moral worth as human beings. And that crucially, sometimes actually respecting someone requires telling hard truths, even risking offending someone, engaging in robust debate that we're afraid, you know, it feels like we're in such a divided moment right now, the culture wars are everywhere, that often in our personal lives, it can be, you know, we want to avoid uncomfortable conversations, it can feel easier just to like avoid a difficult discussion or topic and just sweep it under the rug, but we have to remember that's actually a way to love someone well, to respect them, is to have an honest, although potentially un uh, uh, uncomfortable, potentially hurtful conversation, because that's a way to love and respect someone that's stemming from true civility and not settling for faux superficial politeness. I love etymology, the story of our language and our words. English and other languages as well is often, it's always fascinating and often very illuminating. It tells an interesting story about the meaning of words and the um, etymology of civility and politeness illuminates this distinction I make. People often conflate these words, there's a contention that says, you know, we need more civility and politeness in public life, and, and let's just get back to this time of harmony in, in, in American history, and that'll all will be good again. And there's a contention that says, no, we need less civility in public life. It's the tool of the patriarchy. It's the tool of, you know, the oppressor and white supremacists. We need less civility and politeness in public life in order to achieve greater justice and equity. And I say, both those contingents, wrongfully conflate these two ideas when we need to disambiguate them and see them for what they are uh, as very different. The etymology, again, supports this distinction that people often miss. Politeness comes from the Latin root polare, which means to smooth or to polish, and that's what politeness does. It's external, it's superficial, whereas civility comes from the Latin root kiwitas. And you know we're we're all in the interest of of of, of the civis and statesman and statesmanship here. What what does kivitas mean? People. It's the Latin root of the city, of citizenship, of the citizen, of civilization itself, and that is what civility is. It's the conduct, it's the mores, it's the habits, it's the disposition, the inner orientation of a citizen in the city that especially in a democracy like our own, requires having robust, honest conversation, not sweeping our differences under the rug, but deep bringing our deeply held visions of the good to the fore and having, a, having dialogue about them. That debate is the lifeblood of a free and, and flourishing democracy. And if we fail to be uh, able to or willing to do that, then our democracy is in peril. So anyway, I left this toxic environment in government and I fled. I came home from work one day and I said to my husband, I am done with DC. 
I am done with politics. Let's move to Indiana, I said. I had, um, we had been there a few times. My husband's from Indiana originally, and in my mind, and we had talked one day about moving there and, you know, raising a family of our own, being closer to his family. Um, but in my mind, you know, I was escaping the swamp and um, living and m moving towards the e bucolic pastures and innocent farmlands and rolling hills. And that's what my soul craved more than anything else. And so my husband says to me, okay, sounds good. We'll move to Indiana. No take backs. And a few months later, we had moved out there. And we've been there almost six years now. And one of my first friends, when we moved to Indiana, her name was Joanna Taft. And she came up to me after church one day and said, hi, I'm Joanna. Would you like to porch with us sometime? And I had never heard the word porch used as a verb before. But we didn't know many people in town. And, and you know, we were curious. So we went to her porch that afternoon. And what I saw on Joanna's porch that day was a quiet revolution that she was staging against our divided, our atomized, our alienated status quo. She had curated people on her porch that day across race, across politics, across geography, across um, class, not to have structured conversations across difference. You know, you say your bit and you, you say yours and we'll talk about the issues of the day. No, it was just a chance to be people from different sectors of life in a shared space. It was an oasis, an intentional oasis from the division and from the outside world that wants us to assign value to this one aspect of who we are, our politics, our, our skin color. And we were just for a moment, for an afternoon, allowed to be seen and known and loved in the fullness of who we were as human beings and not by virtue of these, um, these superficial aspects of who we are, superficial but important aspects of who we were. And um, I, I had the privilege of traveling across the country as part of my Novak Fellowship that, that Jillian mentioned to study people like Joanna Taft who are doing the same thing. That some of them have front porches, but many of them don't. Some of them have coffee shops, some of them have front stoop, some of them hold, um, you know, hold supper clubs. That it's just about uh, taking what you have at your disposal and using it to build community wherever you are. It's, it's a quiet revolution because it's saying, I can't control what's happening in Washington. Who's at the White House? What bill's being passed? What Elon Musk is doing with the algorithm? What's up with TikTok these days? But I can control myself. And I am going to choose to make the world a better and brighter and warmer place from right where I am. And that's the reality that we have way more, par more power to either be a part of the solution or part of the problem, then we realize. How, how, how am I doing on time? Are we done? No? Okay. okay. Feel free to give me, uh, wind me down whenever, <laughs> whenever you're ready. Um, so we have, we have way more power to be, be part of the solution um, than, than we realize. Um, you know, it's really interesting that jo Joanna chose the porch as her place uh, to, 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 to live this lifestyle because the porch actually has a lot of cultural significance, metaphorical significance. There's this famous essay written by a gentleman named Richard H. Thomas that I encourage you all to go read for yourself. It's called From Front Porch to Patio, written in a now defunct outlet called The Palimpsest. Do you remember The Palimpsest? <laughs> um, and, and in this essay, he, 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 he makes an argument about the front porch. He says that 100 years ago, you know, turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s, homes were built with these great big front verandas. And these porches, that those marked, that, that architectural statement was, made a cultural um, stance, one of communalism, of presence. You know, Jane Jacobs, anyone heard of Jane Jacobs? Um, you know, famous uh, community activist in New York City. She called it eyes in the street. Like it's a, it's a way that you, when you spend time on your porch with your community, you're able to watch out for your neighbors. You know your neighbors, and you wave, you wave by your, you know, strangers, passers-by alike. It's not quite the public nature of the sidewalk, nor is it the private intimacy of your dining room, 
or living room. It's, it's this quasi-public sphere that's, that when you, when, you, when you spend time on it, it does make an important social statement. And Thomas says that over the last 100 years, slowly the front porch moved from the back of the house toward the side of the house to the modern day patio. We are not just, you know, staying on your porch and, 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 and spontaneously seeing whoever passes by and giving an opportunity for your neighbor to, to, to stop and chat and, and have a beverage with you that, um, you know, all of a sudden you're behind a fence and you're curating who do you want to be around? Your friends, your family, just the neighbors you like, not just any peasant walking by. Um, and then it gets even worse, you know, people, and this is the, the, the point that Putnam makes, and I'm sure you've, you've talked to and talked to, talked to uh, read or at least talked about Robert Putnam, who says, you know, we withdrew even further into, uh, from the porch, uh, from the patio into the, into the house, you know, with, with an air conditioning and into, into the television. We're even more isolated. We're not even with a few, the few curated people that we want to be with anymore. Now we're, now we're just alone on our screens. And, and the point that Thomas makes is that this architectural shift marked a social one, one from more communalism, more communitarianism, to a more individualistic ethos, where we're no longer rooted and present in the community, that, that it becomes more about us and our needs and our preferences and our tastes and our wants. And this is, in many ways, the concern that um, Adam Ferguson was, was expressed in his essay that the way in which the market is, uh, it meets consumer needs and, and, and demands, and that we're able to just kind of live a life that is curated to our sensibilities and, and, and tastes. So again, we see the similar argument repeating itself. But I mean, it's not just Thomas, and it's not just Ferguson, uh, who gave us the term civil society, who were worried about threats to community human community and, and American community. I mean, uh, Aristotle talks about the society civilis, or civil society, the, the koinone, uh, 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 but like, this is the, the Greek, 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 Greek version of, of civil society. Um, and he, Aristotle, thought that when communities got too big, that was when you had to be concerned about the health of the community. He, he believed in really small polises, really small city-states where people could know each other. You know, little, little little communities, and so he was worried about society getting too 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 big and, and anonymous, and that was a threat to to communal health. There is a gentleman, a North African scholar named Ibn Khaldun, who was a Muslim theorist, and he he wrote about um, he wrote he wrote about civil society too. He has this concept called asabiyah, and this is his view of of social harmony, of social cohesion. This fellow feeling that is that maps on perfectly to this, you know, dogged sense of of, of a love of others, this dogged res uh, social resilience that we all have as human beings. As he was, he was really concerned about, you know, the acid Vienna society and the health of it. And Khaldun, in the Middle Ages, was worried about commerce. He was worried about markets and 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 what they were doing to to threaten. Asabia and corrode the social bonds between people. So Aristotle, um, Ibn Khaldun, Ferguson, Tocqueville. What was Tocqueville concerned about when it came to the health of, of community and, and American civil society? Do you remember? Are we there yet? Give us some ideas. Yes. I mean, he talked about um, the importance of small associations. Yes. And how important it is to know the people. Mm -hmm. He talks a lot about the obligation of neighbors in a democracy and how yes. it's kind of like the aristocracy of France. Right. He was also, it's a great, great point, and you know, there's, nothing, there's very little he doesn't treat and <laughs> talk about in, in, in his two volumes. Are you getting through both volumes, by the way? Oh, heavens, what a dream. But there's, um, there is very little he doesn't treat, but you know, he was deeply concerned and writes a lot about individualism, right, in America, and how that's like, <laughs> That's, that's egoism unchecked. You know, he has this line about how America seems to have, have reduced egoism to a science. <laughs> it's a great and memorable line. And that's exactly why he knew that civil society, these, you know, this, these, these spontaneous um, groupings, coming, comings together around shared love, shared ideas, shared missions, were so important because they were an important check 
right? They the, the communal check to the to the, and, and to the and to balance out the the individualist selfish impulse that left unchecked was a deep threat to democracy, to a thriving uh, to a thriving human community. Robert Nisbet. Raise your hand if you've have you talked about Nisbet in this class. He wrote this very famous book, very important book called The Quest for Community. And can you guess? Just take some guesses. We've talked about lots of kind of big bads, lots of threats to community and civil society so far. We've talked about commerce and markets. We've talked about air conditioning. We've talked about television. We've talked about just inherent egoism and individualism and self-love. What do you think Robert Nisbet's big concern was about civil society? The big threat that was undermining social cohesion and bonds. Just take some other guesses. He, and he, I'll mention he wrote this book in the 1950s. So that's the, I'll give you a cue. And he was an American. Yes. Maybe automobile. Automobile, okay. Interesting, technological, yeah. Any other guesses? From yeah. As well, suburban sprawl, perhaps automobile, television, um, just the decline of associations. He talks about bowling, right? No, uh, that's Putnam. Putnam. No, that's we're Putnam. we're getting okay. there. We're not well, at Putnam yet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, different robber in civil society. So uh, it was actually war. He was deeply concerned about how World War II had had centralized a ton of power and sovereignty in the state that was then being exercised in local communities and families in, in, un, in, in newfound ways that was damaging these really fragile communal and social and familial bonds. And he was really worried about total war and what that was doing to community, civil society, local governance. Um, and then let's get to Putnam now. Okay, so Putnam, Robert Putnam wrote this famous um, essay turned book called Bowling Alone. And you know, to Putnam, we have him to thank for um, staging a revival of Tocqueville. You know, a lot of people only know and care about Tocqueville because because Robert Putnam sounded the alarm about the importance of Tocquevillian, you know, civil society to a democracy. Because because Putnam borrows from Tocqueville and and, and um, is very influenced by him. And, um, and of course, Putnam is worried about things like television, air conditioning. He, he, he looks at the 1950s and 1960s and says, this is a golden era of civil society. You know, we're bowling together, we're donating, we're volunteering, we're running for office, we're, we're nice to each other. He goes through all these, every chapter is a different um, metric, a different aspect of, of community uh, measuring civic health. And he goes, well, and look at today. And by today, he's talking about the early, 19, early to mid-1990s and saying, and look at all these, this precipitous decline. We're giving less. We're having fewer people over for dinner. We're voting less. We're running for office less. We're bowling, not less, <coughs> but not together. We're bowling <coughs> alone. And that's worrisome if we're, cause, cause of, you know, it's a threat that we're just not doing life together. In, the, in these voluntary ways, that, that, that's problematic for democracy because we need to have a basic knowledge of, affection for, trust in our fellow citizens for our democracy to survive and, and flourish. So Putnam was, worried about, Putnam was worried about this decline in civil society and he talks about things like air conditioning and telephone and all these other technological, um, um, and television, television's a big one, all these other technological innovations that are corroding um, human community and civic life. But you know, here's, here's what's interesting. A lot of people today kind of mention Tocqueville and Putnam in the same breath and they just assume that civil society is going to hell in a handbasket and democracy is in peril. They're in this like perpetual state of crisis. And, and we know, you know, just, just looking at this intellectual record, that this is not a new problem. This is not a new question. This cha the, that challenges to human social life, to human social bonds, are timeless, perennial, and myriad. There are many of them. And they ultimately stem from a part of the human personality that we all share. And that that means, our human self-love means that civil society will ebb and flow. Technological, social, cultural changes will cause 
things to be better and worse in some periods of time. And there's no question that technology is, uh, and new epiphenomena like you know markets and commerce will will cause stressors and and, and will cause um, you know even pe temporary decline and, and, and strain on our fragile social bonds, but that we are also socially resilient as a species. We are doggedly social. As long as we've been around in all times and places, we've come together in, in community and in relationship because we know it's just a better life, not just optimal chances of survival, but we know it's the good life. We thrive in relationship with others. And I hope that you keep that in mind when it's, it's really tempting, like especially in the wake of the pandemic, just to you know, stay home and watch Netflix and get, get takeout alone in our pajamas rather than go out and see with friends or you know, just go to sleep doom scrolling rather than you know, making the effort and like going, you know, having people over. It can feel really tempting to just not do life together, right? But it's like going to the gym. It's hard to get there, but we never regret it. You know, it's, it's the good life. And it's voluntary decisions like that, you know, choosing to invite someone over or accept an invitation. That can sometimes be harder, just not find an excuse. That's what civil society is and depends on. And that's what democracy and the good life depends on, too, that we have way more power to be a part of the problem or part of the solution than, than we realize. And just, you know, one last thing about Putnam and Nisbet, it, it, it kind of saddens me that people kind of take Putnam as the, the last and final word on this, even though it's data that was sourced 30 years ago, and they, they, they cited around this bowling loan civil society's decline as if it was written yesterday. And here's a really interesting thing. Putnam's golden age for civil society was what? Do you remember? What era? What decades? The 1950s, 1960s. This is exactly Robert Nisbet's low watermark of, of civil society, of saying, oh my gosh, like we're worried about war and, and how, like it just depends what you're looking at and what you're looking for and on what metrics you're using. And the reality is that human social life is dynamic, robust, fluid, fragile, all of the above. And that is uh, important for us to remember because it, it, it makes our responsibility in that all the more, all the more important. I'll tell you one last story about the porch that I hope encourages you to feel a greater sense of agency about what you're learning and what you're reading and how that can empower you to be a better citizen but also a better friend in your everyday. When Marcus Aurelius was emperor of Rome, he endowed four chairs of philosophy. For the Aristotelians, he endowed the Lyceum. For the Platonists, he endowed, anyone know? The Academy. Anyone heard of Plato's Academy before? For the um, Epicureans, he endowed the Garden. And for the Stoics, he endowed the Stoa, the front porch. And the Stoics and, and, and Marcus Aurelius, they, he, he, he led the Roman Empire and the Stoics lived through a period of the Roman Empire that was a similar season of kind of existential dread and angst and plague and pestilence and regime overhaul and war and you know, all these things that we're familiar with today that, that ca can cause a lot of fear. Right? Um, you know, you might be regular consumers of the news. If, if we want to be citizens of the world and future leaders, it can feel this is what we ought to do. You know, know what's going on in the world around us. But that can be really kind of overwhelming and anxiety-inducing. Just, just um, being inundated with suffering and injustice, all of which we have no control over. And the Stoics, in response to their season, epoch of sort of existential angst and crisis and chaos, they said, I can't change the world, but I can change myself. And I'm going to make the world a more better, a, a better place and a brighter place, which is exactly, without having ever read the Stoics, Joanna Taft did the same from her front porch, you know, when I first moved to Indianapolis six years ago. Timeless problem, timeless solution. It starts with us, and we each have a, a duty and a privilege to be a part of the solution in our everyday. And the more of us that choose to reclaim the soul of civility, the you know, choosing to see the other in the fullness of who they are, making them feel seen and known and loved, and doing that, you know, just sitting in our classrooms, you know, asking someone how they're doing and meaning it. You know, and getting in the Uber and, and you know, earnestly 
um, seeing our Uber driver or checking out at the, at the cafeteria and, and making the, the cafeteria later feel seen and known and loved. That, that is, those are the small but fragile threads that weave together and sustain the tapestry of not just our civil society. And I talk about, I talk about civility as this essential building block of civil society. Who's going to want to bowl together if everyone's a jerk, you know? But so not just our civil society, but our democracy as well, that this is the beauty of our regime, that the citizen is prior to the state. And we each have this privilege and this incredible responsibility to, to wield that power of, of how we interact each day voluntarily well and with justice and, and grace. So thank you again, Greg. Thank you, Louisville. Thanks to the McConnell Center for having me. I'm so thrilled that you all have copies of the book now. I'd love to take some questions from you based on uh, remarks, based on what you've read, just based on where you're at in life right now, what's on your mind, uh, what worries you, what causes you concern. I'd love to uh, talk with you and hear from you now and um, love to sign your book um, before we leave tonight. But privileged to be with you. Thanks for having me.